So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Grace Law, and I'm chair of the Department of Architecture here at the Harvard GSD. So Positions is a series of conversations convened by our department aimed at revealing the positions taken by players on the field of contemporary architecture. The series hopes to unfold the complexity of relations and metaphors to make them explicit, inviting faculty and guests to voice where they stand. So we're, we're really very delighted today to welcome Niraj Bhatia, um, who is an architect and urban designer whose work resides at the intersection of politics, housing, infrastructure, and urbanism. Niraj is the principal of the Open Workshop, a design research office examining the negotiation between architecture and its territorial environment. Recent recognition includes the Architectural League Emerging Voices Award, the Canadian Professional Prix de Rome, the Architectural League Young Architects Prize, Emerging Leaders Award from Design Intelligence, among many other grants and honors. The Open Workshop's design research has been commissioned by the Seoul Biennale, the Venice Biennale, the Chicago Architecture Biennale, and the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Niraj is currently teaching a GSD option studio in housing in the Central Valley um, of California. He is also an associate professor at the College, um, California College of the Arts, where he also co-directs the urbanism research lab called the Urban Works Agency. Uh, he has held teaching positions at UC Berkeley, um, UT Arlington, Cornell, Rice, and various others. Uh, Niraj is co-editor of books Bracket Takes Action, and then that's Bracket 1 and Bracket 2, um, Go Soft, um, and is the author of New Investigations in Collective Form, as well as pamphlet Architecture 30 uh, called Coupling. Strategies for Infrastructural Opportunism. His articles have appeared in El Croquis, Volume, Arcus, Log, AA Files, New Geographies, Thresholds, Manifest, many, many more, as well as Yale Perspecta. Chris Lee um, is the co-founder and principal of Siri Architects in London, Mumbai, and Singapore. The work of Siri is underpinned by the exploration of the problem of type and the city, with particular emphasis on the renewed relevance of typological reasoning in response to climate adaptation and a globalized discourse on architecture and urbanism. Chris's designs have been recognized through many prestigious awards, including the President's Design Award Singapore, the International High Rise Award, Domus 50 Best Architecture Firms, World Architecture Festival, Best Mixed Use Building, Blueprint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He is currently working on several civic and cultural institution and um, uh, campus research buildings, including the Singapore Science Park Cluster One and two tall buildings um, in Earls Court, London, that I've actually visited this past summer. Um, he has completed the new Singapore State Courts and a number of other institutional buildings, as well as the Jamil Art Center in Dubai. Chris is currently teaching an option studio on the development of innovation districts in the English countryside. He's previously served in numerous positions at the GSD, and prior to these roles, he was the director of the AA Pro Projective Cities MPhil program and AA Diploma and Intermediate Unit Master. Chris is the author of Common Frameworks, Rethinking the Developmental City in China, Working in Series, and co-authored Typological Formations, Renewable Building Types, and the City. He is also co-edited Wiley Academy architectural design issue called Typological Urbanism, Projective Cities. Please join me in welcoming Niraj and Chris. Okay, so looks like uh, I'll start. Grace, no, Grace, thank you so much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, especially, you know, really honored to share yeah, the stage with you, Niraj. So I'll jump into it because each of us have only <laughs> 30 minutes. So uh, we've been asked to look at three parts, uh, past, present, and future. So I would like to say that I will start with the past, both in terms of ancestors and precedent, that is to say that we have ancestors, and then perhaps go into the present, which is also related a little bit to the past, and then touch a little bit on the future, which is, I would call, a future present. Yeah. So uh, the first one, uh, ancestors and precedent. So Siri was started uh, as a practice, actually, in multiple locations across the globe. Very much, I would say, we are one of the first few 
generations that were thrust into a globalized uh, mode of architectural production, the very first time in which we graduate. And we find ourselves that we did not have a global signature or a, a style to proliferate our project. So we very much felt that our work should be embedded uh, in the context that it sits, but yet remain somewhat unfamiliar and yet familiar. So therefore, we looked at the city. Now, why we looked at the city is because we felt that it is an example of, uh, as an example of space of coexistence par excellence. And the polarity of the city uh, allows us to think about an architecture that could act uh, as an accommodative framework that is able to host a multitude of yeah, uh, conflicting desire, conflicting ambition, at the same time remain relevant to any site and city that we work in. So obviously we are uh, indebted to Rossi, uh, I would say, and actually to Rossi of the 1960s and 1970s, but less with the Rossi of, let's say, the 1980s or <laughs> 1990s, in which, as you know, uh, it very much became an image of history rather than a true study of the architecture of what should be, uh, what Rossi calls a collective memory. So what we learned most from Rossi is this, is the idea of the urban artifact. Uh, the urban artifact for Rossi essentially is about um, both, he says, housing as well as monument. But what is key to the urban artifact that it is both permanent as well as propelling. Now, what he means by that, I think this is a great example when he used Palazzo di Regione, is that he says that the urban artifact is permanent yet propelling precisely because it is independent of programmatic failure. And that the same permanent structure could exist for centuries, moving from, let's say, a housing for an aristocrat to a market, to a school, to an army barracks. And because it is permanent and involved in the life of the city, it is also an element that is propelling. And because of that, it accretes the memory of the city and becomes relevant and belongs to the citizens of the city. And we found this incredibly uh, inspiring and also instructive, especially when I was doing uh, research on my PhD on Rossi, is this four diagrams that you see in an unpublished article uh, he calls Due Progretti, looking at two projects. And he firmly uh, and, and clearly mentioned that the same structure that you've seen previously in the bottom right, uh, bottom right corner, the irreducible structure of the urban artifact, was used by him to create his early projects. From the top, you see the uh, Milan Triennale that looks at the elongated wall as a street as well as an exhibition space. In the middle is the Milan uh, housing, and the bottom is San Rocco. So I think in the Milan housing, what you see so fundamentally, I think, true to his research was that you see that there is this two moment of the city that is figured forth and reified in a single project. On the top is the structure of rooms, of housing, of, uh, of dwelling, and has the scale of domesticity. And at the bottom, on the ground floor, is imprinted. The same structure drops onto the ground floor, becomes a colonnaded street. And these two moments of housing and monument, in a sense, allows us to think about the idea of the city, or rather, uh, almost an open framework, a structure that allows a social space to unfold, or in waiting for social spaces to unfold. Two mo mo moments of the city abstracted from the reading of the, of, of let's say, the urban artifact, and create something new. So, uh, without taking too much time from Mira. So I think this also influenced our first project that we won uh, in Singapore about 10 years ago. It looks at a, uh, yeah, a, a, a court building. In front of you see is the existing court, which is called the Hexagon, that houses three courts, uh, civil, criminal, as well as family. And in most court buildings, you'll see that uh, why they remain so solid is because um, there are three circulations that have to be kept separate, the judges, the accused, and the public. So what we did was to actually uh, we re-looked at the deep structure of this type and to create a tall building that has a very limited footprint that is 
created as two towers. The front tower being the public tower where all the, uh, the court boxes as well as the public uh, spaces are, and at the back tower, linked by bridges, are uh, where the judges and uh, court staff sits. And linking the two are 39 bridges that the court as well, the court staff as well as the judges move uh, move from one space to the other, and then the the, the building sits very very tightly in in, in the scale in, in in the site, and it's linked to the octagon building by a small pavilion. And as I say, we look at the typical element of the city or the dominant type of the city. So in this site, you'll see that there are two dominant types. One is the uh, persistent architecture of what I call the persistent architecture of the shop houses and the other one is uh, the high-rise building that is ubiquitous in Singapore. So we wanted to bring those two moments together into a single building. So the front tower is is expressed as a series of platforms or ground planes in which court boxes are placed and in which each plane becomes a landscape deck. And this landscape deck becomes open spaces for uh, uh, court users, very, very stressful, to enjoy the views but also to recuperate and, and to find repose uh, in these high-rise gardens. The other was the, pre uh, the prevalence of neoclassical architecture that was used in, uh, this brought by the British, um, for, court, uh, for court buildings. So this is the Supreme Court that was emptied out. So what was quite um, intriguing about this is the way in which, as we know, colonnades and porticos are used as court buildings. So we reinterpreted that uh, as a series of open facades where the orders are seen as structural columns that expands and contracts to the corner to take load. And then, of course, on top of it is the courtrooms. And the other element, of course, is the roof of uh, the, uh, the shop houses of Chinatown, and in which, again, we begin to abstract its texture, its color, and then to apply them onto the court boxes. In a way, the same granularity as well as um, uh, the, the, the texture into it. So as you come up here from, from uh, the lift course, you enter the lobby, you'll always see the old building of the courthouse. So, yeah, and the back tower is a very simple one. Um, so I, I think this is, maybe I will just skip through to this. I think this uh, is one of my favorite uh, images. It shows the three moments of the city, the moment of the shop house, the tall buildings in the 60s and 70s, and then our addition at the back, uh, which is, in a way, we hope it's uh, new, but also, yeah, strange, strangely familiar uh, to, to everyone. Um, amazing. Um, well, thank you, Grace, first of all, for having us. And thank you, Chris. It's actually very difficult to follow that. Um, but I think your work has actually been very influential uh, to me in my work. And so I think there's a lot of overlaps that we can talk about um, today. Um, so the, the Office the Open Workshop, we just had our 10-year anniversary. And so it's been a really nice timing to reflect back on what we've been doing these last 10 years. and. Um, you know, the, I would say the office started with a position, and uh, you try to hold on to it. But as we move into practice, it's really been, uh, I would say, a challenge to have a position while you're practicing. And I think it's something that uh, we're trying to work through as we uh, start moving into building projects. Um, I think one of the things that, um, for me, is very interesting is trying to think through what is the collective today. And the collective as an idea is very... Um, unstable, conflicting, difficult to locate, and how can we actually use architecture and design to think through what the collective might be, how it comes together, and how it assembles. I think this is uh, particularly important because if we really try to think about climate change, dealing with COVID, wh whatever things that uh, we're facing on the horizon, it really starts with us uh, working and acting together. Um, so I think architecture is extremely difficult in general, I think it's extremely difficult today because I think the, the discipline has been uh, typically and traditionally indebted to questions of control, which is often uh, neglected, flattened, or assimilated the evolving, transforming conditions of the socio-political and natural realm. And so I think this is uh, almost an impossible scenario to be an architect in because we know that ordering the world is in some ways futile, um, and there's so many things we can't predict about where the world is going to. And so how do we actually kind of design with our disciplinary tools or rethink our disciplinary tools in light of um, kind of say a more 
volatile sociopolitical realm and an evolving uh, environmental realm. And this isn't to say that these are new. I think it's always been a volatile sociopolitical realm and the environment has always been evolving. I think we're just recognizing the futility of trying to order these things. Um, so for me, you know, one of the, say, key, um, I would say, texts that has been very influential has been Umberto Eco's open work, uh, which he wrote in 1962 and was his dissertation. And in the text, um, Echo goes through and characterizes various works of art and poetry and film as either closed or open, depending on the relationship between the subject, which is the viewer of the work, the object, the work of art itself, and the author, who's the artist. And for Echo, the closed conception was a work um, wherein the subject was to see and interpret the object in a singular manner the way that the author prescribed it. So that was seen as a successful form of work. He goes on then to speak of the emergence of the open work around the Baroque period, which has been strategically designed by the author to have a degree of openness. So each individual could thereby project the missing pieces to complete the work. And while the open work allowed for this uh, possibility of numerous personal experiences and interventions, it still always maintained its status as a work by being framed by, quote, the world intended by the author. Um, so he has several examples in the text, um, compositions by Stockhausen and Bluez, metaphors of Kafka, puns of Joyce, um, but in each case, the open work always inserts the subject as an active agent in the production of the work. And I think for me, this has always been a powerful concept to think about the simultaneity of an underlying order and an openness for indeterminate acts. Now, Echo doesn't talk about architecture in his book, but if you were to apply this to architecture, I would argue that you would need to expand the subject uh, from just the you know, political subject of us to also the environmental context or site that every piece of architecture is uh, situated within. And I think this is something that we're trying to unpack in all of our projects across a range of contexts and scales. And so I see the office as a larger pursuit in trying to experiment about what openness might mean and how this might provide more agency uh, to the environmental context as well as the socio-political context. Um, so I'll just show one project as an example of this. And in some ways, it's a very literal interpretation of the uh, open work. Um, this was an exhibition we did in 2018. Um, called New Investigations of Collective Form, which really piggybacked off um, Maki's text, Investigations in Collective Form. Um, and part of the reason for piggybacking off this one was it was a very influential text to me as a student and still is. Um, but also we were designing this exhibition in a building designed by Maki, um, so it seemed fitting. Maki, although in a different part of his career, like, like Rossi, uh, late stage Maki. Um, and so, you know, it's amazing, this is the you know, uh, screen grab of the original text, and you can see some of the things he's talking about, the, you know, how do we deal with uh, any formal ideas? Um, we need to kind of think through politics and economics, and new formal concepts are, uh, have to address problems characterized by coexistence and conflict of uh, heterogeneous institutions and individuals, unprecedented, unprecedented and rapid um, transformations in the physical structure of society, rapid communication methods, and technological progress and its impact on regional cultures. And I think, you know, this is written in 1964. We could apply the same statements today. I think we're still grappling with this. Um, and so Maki, in his text, has three uh, techniques of collective form, compositional form, mega form, and group form. Um, and at this time in the office, we were doing a lot of, I'd say, territorial scaled projects, looking at infrastructure and systems and how they could be rewired to make more equitable cities. Uh, this exhibition really gave us a chance to step back um, after about four years of work and reflect on our work. And we arranged our projects into five additional techniques of collective form, uh, which we called rewiring states, living archives, articulated surfaces, frameworks, and commoning. Um, the design itself was quite simple. It was a field condition that uh, had these larger hub models that centered each of these themes. And all the contents were suspended from an interconnected pulley system from the ceiling. And these could be transformed by the user, uh, both through users sitting on the benches and their weight deflecting some of the modules around, or nature represented through plants. The exhibition was up for about six months, so the plants actually grew during the exhibition and changed in weight and composition. Um, and so in this way, you know, as a very literal, say, example of an open work, um, 
people, nature, and our own work at the time was put together in a system where there's a feedback between the individual and the collective. And this idea of collective form as this kind of feedback mechanism that's always being negotiated, I think is what we were trying to say emulate um, through the exhibition design itself. So the subject can really configure their relationship to the content. And in some ways, ideas of um, working together or solidarity form different ideas of power of how larger, heavier things can be moved in the exhibition. Um, we eventually uh, put this together into a book um, to flush out and frame these ideas of collectivity in the open work. And I would say that, you know, for us at this time, like books and exhibitions have been really key, critical mediums by which to work through some of these ideas. All right. To the present. <laughs> so this is the present part. So present meaning it's been like eight years since we started <laughs> this project. That's how slow architecture is. So I, th I thought uh, to talk about the present because um, on, on both counts, one, I call it a persistent architecture. It's persistent because it's persistent as, as the way in which when we move to a site, we always look at what we call the typical, right? What is typical in the city is also what persists in the city. And it persists precisely because the architecture is sanctioned by cultural and social use. And we find if it is so, then there is a certain relevance that could be recuperated to create new work. So one example of that um, is uh, an ashram site uh, in Dharampur in India, in which we were asked to design a hall that will sit 5,000 people at one go. And they will come every weekend uh, to meet, um, uh, to, to stay together, to, to celebrate uh, together with uh, their guru and, and, and to talk about Jainism. So where do we start is that we begin to look at the concept of uh, Samavasaran, in which the concept in Jainism is that really is about arriving at enlightenment through the building blocks of knowledge through discourse. So in that way, you will see that most Jain temples and Hindu temples actually reifies this concept, where a single element, a very simple element, is repeated almost infinitely to create a shikara that moves towards the sky. And I find this really intriguing because not only that it uh, reifies the concept of knowledge coming together as uh, elements, but also the the use and repeti the repetition of, or infinite repetition of the same element. It's almost like a chant uh, that becomes so transcendental and so meditative because of its pure repetition. So what we did was that to use the most irreducible element here is a single room. There are 13 rooms here that stack above each other. And as it stacks, it rotates at every 45 degrees. And that is all that we did. So that stacking arranges these different boxes. It aligns to the valley. On the left is a dining hall. And on the right-hand side uh, is, is the temple uh, that is built from scratch. But it takes on a traditional temple. So as you approach uh, the building, you'll see that um, there are several rotations. It creates both as uh, entrances as well as a cascading silhouette as, as you move through. So no matter how, how you approach it, and uh, whether from down from the valley or from the back, you will always be presented uh, with an axis that you are able to orientate yourself. So at the lowest uh, block, the first rotation, it's a rotation that holds the biggest drum as well as entrances. So the biggest drum, in a way, the, seat, the, uh, the seating capacity has to be 5,000 people. This is the discourse hall or the satsang hall. It is held up by four slightly curved arches. And as you see where the curved arches are, where they meet that triangle space, that is the entrance to the drum, but also it forms the entrance in the four different corners. So that's aligned in such a way that it also therefore creates a drum that is completely structured and column free that spans almost 45 meters. So that's a really huge span. So that rotation also creates eight different entrances. Uh, the entrances for men and women are separated, but we did not want to separate that. So we just merely use that rotation to create a subtle uh, branching to the left and to the right where men and women enter, but of course they all meet together in, in the drum. Uh, and also where that rotation is also seating, uh, that also sh showcases where the inner circulation is. 
So as you enter, you'll see the drum or the discourse hall. So that drum becomes a natural circumambulatory device that allows um, the ashramites to move on the ground floor almost without any signages. Mm -hmm. So that's so you see that drum now uh, with with the four different walls. So this is just recently completed about a couple of months ago. So that's you, you can see that four different arches. This is looking up to the balcony. You'll see that on the ground floor there are no seating because uh, all the ashramites, they sit cross-legged. And this is where the, the arches meet. So this is also where the threshold between the outside of the drum into the inside of the drum. And this is the view above, looking at the oculus of the building with the baffled ceiling creating a concentric circle, um, uh, re-emphasizing the circularity of the drum. So as you move another rotation upwards, you'll see that that rotation now creates four triangles, uh, voids. Within that four triangle voids, we place uh, four circular staircases that then leads you up uh, to the balcony seating, uh, also moving around. So that's the circular spiral staircases that sweeps you up onto the balcony and then into the upper balcony. And again, I think the presence of the arches uh, uh, making those space, I think, quite uh, quite spectacular. And as we move up, um, uh, so more rooms are now created, classroom, libraries, as well as a small museum. And finally, at the very, very apex, the last, the 13th room, is the meditation hall that is the most sacred. So this meditation hall uh, is open up to the sky with uh, light washing down the walls. And because we wanted to reduce the weight uh, that sits on the arch, so we actually held uh, the external skin with a space frame. And in a way that uh, the cladding, which is marble, is used uh, in a way becomes almost translucent in its nature. And this building is actually worked on a very low budget. It actually is uh, financed by donation. So what we've looked in terms of materiality was that we wanted to also mirror the same material that is used by Jain temples. Essentially, they've been using this for centuries, is to use marble. But what we did was uh, we actually use off-cut marbles, essentially marble that is discarded. Nobody wants them. And we broke them down to really tiny slats, uh, 20, meter, uh, 20 centimeter uh, long slats, so that they are able to take the gentle curves and also the openings uh, of the building. And then from afar, I think it gives a very beautiful texture, but also a certain crispness that highlights the, the tautness of the form, but gives it that really, yeah, uh, gentle uh, and also very, very uh, cheap facade, yeah, low cost facade. Yeah. Um, congratulations. That, oh, that project's you. amazing. <laughs> it's <laughs> amazing to see it um, all done. Um, so, I guess in the second section, I'll kind of shift a little bit from collective form to questions of um, the commons. And for me, this really started um, in 2016 looking at communes. So, uh, the city of San Francisco has a huge history of communes, uh, but there's still several that exist today. And what I became very fascinated what, about was how people uh, governed resources and stewarded and maintained the commons and how they created, uh, say, alternate forms of living on their own terms and had really agency in forming their way of life. I mean, this idea of like self-determination, I think, becomes really interesting for me. Um, of course, you know, we all know these images from the 60s and 70s of um, the experiments that were being done in and around San Francisco, which were really rooted in this rejection of commercialism and an idea of uh, shared property and shared labor and experimentation with alternative family structures. Um, and these communities really negotiated their values. And I think this kind of idea of the negotiation, how can we kind of think about that as giving agency to people? Um, so along with my colleague, Antje Steinmuller, um, we've been studying a range of communes and collective living projects in San Francisco um, over the last seven, eight years by essentially documenting these spaces, documenting the form of these spaces, documenting how uh, resources are shared and allocated, documenting their governance structures, questions of maintenance, and so forth. And the goal here was to really learn from lived experience and how people engage the commons. Um, this report here that's scrolling quickly on the screen was something we produced in uh, 2022 to reform um, 
policy around group housing or collective housing in San Francisco to make it more uh, equitable. Um, I wouldn't say that's the, the major goal of the project. It really started with the curiosity of how do people actually think through the commons. Um, I've always been struck by the, how living in San Francisco, despite the hundreds if not thousands of communes during the 60s and 70s, there's not too much of a trace of them today. And there's you know, several reasons about why they didn't persist. Um, but I would argue that I think they were working too tactically, that there was no kind of strategic nature of how different communes were speaking to each other and trying to scale up, say, a vision. And I think this isn't surprising because the type really emerged in a kind of uh, bottom-up way. And at a particular scale, the management and accountability of the commons becomes challenging. You know, the idea of self-governance really works around 20 to 25 people in our research. As communities get bigger, um, things start falling apart. So I've always been really kind of interested in how do you scale up this idea of self-governance that seems to work at a small scale to be something that could uh, maybe challenge the other more dominant regimes of housing. Um, there's not too many precedents uh, to pull from the Bay Area, but there's two I want to pull out. Um, the first one is a commune group, well, two commune groups that were related called Cauliflower and the Diggers. Um, that attempted to create a dialogue between communes. So some of their initiatives um, were an intercommunal newspaper that were circulated to 300 communes weekly, a free food sharing program, so essentially pooling food stamps and having relationships with various food vendors to get food cheaper and distribute this for free, free medical clinics and so forth. And I think because there's this tendency for communes to have uh, a tendency, say, towards autonomy, and there's an enclave-like nature to them. Um, this idea of trying to create a conversation and a network that exceeded any individual commune uh, was really fascinating. At the same time in the Bay Area, across the Bay in Oakland, uh, the Black Panthers Party was established as this alternative institution rooted in communalism. And there was a relationship here. In fact, Huey Newton met with several of the diggers to kind of figure out how their free, free uh, food program was working. And the diggers actually dropped off food at uh, the first week of the free food program. Um, the Panthers established um, hundreds of programs from free education, health clinics, accountants to help with your taxes, free clothing swaps, and so forth. Uh, perhaps the most well-known is the free breakfast program, which was uh, started in 1969. started with 11 students. Um, by the week's end, it was 135 students. And just about three months later, we were looking at 1,200 children across several cities in America that were being served free breakfast and eventually forced the federal government, or I should say shamed the federal government into producing a national policy for free breakfast. It's a really amazing example of a kind of uh, grassroots initiative that scales up into a policy. Um, so these were some of the things that uh, I was thinking about when we got this invitation to the Chicago Biennial in 2021, uh, which was looking at the available city, uh, which was defined by David Brown, the curator, as the 10,000 vacant publicly owned lots in Chicago. And uh, we were working in Bronzeville, uh, which is on the south side of Chicago. The map on the left just shows some of the empty lots in Bronzeville. Um, there was about 800 empty lots at the time of doing this project. Um, and one interesting thing I will say is that as these lots get empty, um, interesting things happen on them. So community land trusts are buying up certain sites. Uh, you know, in San Francisco, lots are very expensive, so nothing interesting happens on them. But in this context, actually, there's a lot of experimentation. And I think Andrew Hersher has kind of documented similar things in Detroit um, in his Unreal Estate Guide to Detroit. Um, the neighborhood you know, you still see the legacy of redlining in this neighborhood, and there's many forms of precarity that you can look at through different axes of unemployment rates, um, poverty levels, uh, people are living, many people living alone, uh, many elderly folks, and so forth. Um, at the same time, Bronzeville, you know, has really an amazing community, and through this precarity, solidarity, and mutual aid organizations have emerged and are doing really great work. Uh, Paolo's sitting here, and Paolo's worked with uh, many of these groups and actually been instrumental at you know, catalyzing, I think, a lot of the work that these groups are doing. Um, it was difficult doing this project in the Bay Area for a site in Chicago on a three-month timeline to produce something from invitation. And a, I think a different model of a biennial that was rooted in the neighborhood. I think there's structural challenges, I think, for designers that are out of town to do something 
uh, luckily, Paola and Dennis were very helpful for us to uh, introduce us into the world and get us as comfortable as we could be. But we were still at a distance, and we were trying to think through um, the limits of working at a distance from something that's so grounded. Um, we, we started taking this idea of the kind of collective living house and asking what if we fragmented the idea of the domestic commons into an idea of an urban commons and put different programs on different sites um, to occupy these vacant lots and to think about how uh, the kind of frequency of use would determine the density and the location of those programs, essentially trying to get over the enclave-like nature of the commune um, to make it more visible and showcase these kind of models of care as well as uh, creating, say, more relationships with the neighborhood and, you know, creating, say, experiments with land tenure. Um, so this kind of decentralized model of sharing merges the domestic and the urban commons. Um, I think the first thing we did as we started the project was just ask how could the work that's already been done in the neighborhood scale up, situate itself, find its own synergies. Um, and we started first by producing this uh, directory just by trying to for us, learn about what's going on and where it's cited and what the kind of initiatives are. Um, and as we started working through this, we realized many organizations weren't aware of other like-minded organizations because many of them face just deadlines and they're busy and it's hard to find the time to kind of think through um, larger things. We, we started by producing these research papers and directories, cataloging questions of the precarities and the work that's being done. We interviewed over 30 organizations and featured some of those interviews in these papers um, and provided this to the community as a resource. Um, our design proposal has kind of two scales. We thought about a speculative network that could leverage these resources to provide a framework to allow for these grassroots organizations to come together. And um, this is what we are calling the Bronzeville Action Coalition. And essentially, we're trying to look at different forms of land tenure and exchange Think about how different forms of value that can be developed as you network, say, groups working sometimes alone together to realize something bigger. Um, and so this is uh, you know, an, a bird's eye view looking at the actual vacant sites. There's several of these vacant sites. And I think um, for us, you know, we were trying to look for affinities between organizations to think about re, uh, restructuring the neighborhood through these circuits that cut through and connect these sites together. Um, on the grounds of the Anthony, uh, former Anthony Overton Elementary School, uh, where Powell and Dennis have been working for years, I would say that their, their work and the work of the community there has been very inspiring because it's in some ways a microcosm of what we're um, suggesting here, uh, hosting various, say, interventions. Um, and what we proposed was a pavilion sort of s um, scale to the typical vacant lot and thinking about it as a form of an outdoor living room. Um, the pavilion is very simple. Actually, we're, on, we're both on rotation projects right now, I guess, um, where we just have a square with a rotated square and a series of curtains that allows for the space to be expanded or contracted and in some ways really thinks about the um, evolving practices and values of commoning. Um, Paula uh, and Dennis are a force in this neighborhood, and uh, a year later, uh, working with them, we organized this uh, conversation series uh, just to kind of think through what, what are the kind of structural challenges in doing work on the ground and how might these initiatives scale up. And this is obviously something we can't catalyze forward, being at a distance, but I really hope that um, in a small way, maybe some of these conversations think about scale and maintaining local governance. Okay. All right. So, yeah, this part we get to the future. So I think in terms of the future, I think uh, it's more like for us um, the future of the past. Uh, why, and why I say so is because uh, I call it lean frameworks. It's because um, sometimes we feel that um, some of the projects in which were never realized, competition that were never won and so bitterly lost <laughs> in, 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 the, in the life of an architect, are those projects that you return again and again um, as ideas that never settles, ideas that continue to haunt you, to push you forward. And I think one project as such is the project that we've done in London uh, about six years, five years ago, that we feel that suddenly has become more relevant, and I call it, is affecting our thinking now, what we call a lean framework. 
And that has a lot to do with the way in which we have addressed the issue of climate change. For the past, I would say, eight, six years, we are quite good at now looking at operational energy, which is the blue part, in which creating net zero building, we, we've done one in Singapore that was the first net zero energy building of its kind, and that was completed about four years ago. And I think now, uh, uh, where the industry is going as well as where our thoughts are going are in the other 49 because the 51% will continue to drop as the grid becomes greener. So essentially it's the embodied carbon of a building. And if you actually look at the embodied carbon of a building, uh, actually 48% is actually goes to the structure and only about 16, 15% goes to the facade. So we thought as architects, we want to deal with the 48%, although we're not structural engineers. So what do we do? So we felt that if we look at structure, we should look at the structure almost as the deep structure of a type, but also uh, it also could be understood as the irreducible structure that makes the building stand, but also a structure that gives space, that creates clear organizational or typological structure. So the way we have done that, I think, quite clearly in this project was the red is the area of expansion for uh, Royal College of Arts uh, campus. The yellow is the one that is built. And when we approached this competition, um, we came very close. Uh, essentially, we thought that there are two types of learning spaces uh, that a, the school like RCA needs. One is an open studio, almost like the space of a factory. And the other one is more for a concentrated learning, a more solitary learning, um, but still learning amongst others, like a studiolo. So we thought that. Therefore, the building could be uh, described with just three simple elements. The first one is the table. And we thought that the table is quite a unique space uh, as well as organizational giver because the table defines a space, but it has no boundary. And in that sense, a layer of table is able to create a constellation of different faculties that are close to each other, but never uh, enclosed. The other one is oh, sorry. Is the other one is to think about the shelf. Here, the shelf acts uh, as a framework to bring order to a variety of uh, objects, and in the school, it organizes the shared facilities into a single spine. So, for instance, here you'll see seminar rooms, uh, project rooms, uh, laser cutting machine, and it is deliberately open on both sides so that the thinness of the shelf display its content to the school as well as to the city. And the third element is the ladder. It's a, an array of ladder that creates vertical connection. So it allows flexible routes between the floors, bridging the spine as well as the table, and also create spaces of friction that encourages uh, people to move across the building. And as the, and as the irreducible structure comes together, so as a whole composition, the table accommodates and makes visible the creative life and resources uh, of the RCA, clearly displayed for the city. So here, for instance, you'll see that, let's say, the landscape students are looking down towards uh, the sculpture students presenting their work. And then perhaps at the top, uh, skylights open up to the sculpture students as their studio. And as I mentioned, uh, the thinness of the shelf also displays spaces of seminar, lecture theatres, and it becomes what we call a, almost like an urban shelf, right, that, that figures forth the collective act of learning. So the plan is very simple. So you'll see that the tables are stacked on the north, the spine of circulation, and then the shelves, and then the last one. Uh, is the tower of tables where the different research uh, programs are. The building is approached on two sides. The red is approached from uh, uh, the uh, Battersea Road. So there we created a plaza, almost like a forecourt for the entrance. And the other uh, is from the existing campus, a long uh, route leading all the way up to the lobby. So it creates two modes of entrance and uh, experiencing the structure. So from the forecourt, you experience uh, the table structure from its short side. So as you enter, again, 
again, you see the cascading effect uh, of the tables. And if you come through the existing campus, the table structure, that really like structure, the life of the school is uh, completely uh, visible uh, to you. As, and as you enter, that again cascades upwards. So this, uh, this really lean structure or lean architecture, I think it's really affecting the way we think about our work right now. And because we don't have much time, I'll just very quickly show you one of the th things that we're thinking here. We are designing, it's still ongoing now, um, a research cluster of life sciences building, consists of six buildings in Singapore, uh, in which one of the key elements is that we wanted to externalize uh, all the public spaces and the lobby of this really secretive building, which is life, uh, life sciences cluster and to create the space with just a very simple uh, branch, almost arch-like structure. It's almost like a cathedral structure made of a sequestered carbon, like a timber. And that simple structure on a diagonal uh, houses all the elements that makes a communal space or com uh, a collective space possible. A town, a town's square seating, exits from uh, train stations, and so on and so forth. So this is almost completed. Uh, some of the photos that you see are, the, the arch that you see, they are 24 meters uh, span. And this was just taken last week where it all comes together, a very simple structure, uh, yeah, that is informing what we call lean architecture today. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if this is the future or just closer to the present, <laughs> maybe what I'll present, um, but um, actually influenced by some of Chris's early work, you know, we've been looking more and more at type as something that can mediate, scale, and be anticipatory. And I think um, it's, it's kind of interesting to think through how type plays out through specific dimensionality. And I think this is partly because we're trying to shift into building projects. Um, and I think it's a way for us to think through the scale of the city at the scale of a building. Um, this is some I think we started shifting into this direction in 2021 in the Venice Biennial, where we did a series of five speculative collective housing projects um, that were driven through type. Um, and I think more recently, I'll show very quickly kind of two ideas around this. Um, first one is looking at how type on a parcel sets up conditions that you know need to be overcome. So what you're seeing here is your typical San Francisco lot 25 feet wide and the kind of types that exist within that lot and part of the reason for that linear array of rooms and services packed on one side is because of that 25 foot width and despite the fact that many of these houses have been completely gutted and rebuilt those services along the edges along the party walls typically stay in place um, and so what you get is that these kind of property divisions between lots somehow get materialized through the way services are placed in the type, uh, which is a function of its parcel size and then, you know, scales up. And so uh, this is a, a project we did with uh, Spiegel Akara Workshop, uh, SAW, who's a firm based in San Francisco, thinking about how uh, maybe in the idea of a lean framework, maybe a lean infrastructural framework, might consolidate a lot of the services and structure of the building into a module that would be oriented, in fact, uh, perpendicular to the lot and allow for a porosity through the module, um, but in time allow for the possibility to bypass the party wall. So essentially emancipating the party wall from its structural um, and service conditions. Um, so this is the type that we're seeing here. You can see those kind of uh, partly pochette areas being the service areas, and then um, this can aggregate up and you can just, you know, so we're really trying to differentiate between what's just a simple stud wall versus a structural wall, what can be taken down, and how do services in some ways get out of the way to make these uh, lateral connections in time and hopefully erode you know, the idea of uh, the single family home in the block or allow for the possibility of an alternative structure in the block. Um, this next project I'll show very quickly is uh, a project um, that we are almost finishing up. We're just on the punch list for. That's an intergenerational um, house for uh, three inhabitants, and it's an existing house. Um, so what you're seeing on the far left at the top diagram is the existing structure that we essentially plugged a series of smaller rooms onto and created a thickened threshold condition between 
those rooms. Um, and a lot of the characteristics that we were trying to think about in this house were coming from the research on collective uh, housing projects that we had done in the Bay Area. Conditions of that trade-off between the small private spaces that emancipate or give rise to larger collective spaces, um, ideas of spaces that need to be introverted versus spaces that are extroverted, uh, spaces essentially to be alone and together, but also spaces for sub-collectives to form. Um, so these are, sorry, you'll have to bear with my iPhone photos. We don't have professional photos uh, done of the house because um, we're still, there's two or three items still uh, under review. Um, but uh, you know, essentially the house looks very monolithic from some angles. It's got this kind of dialectic readings and it looks much more porous from other angles. And the idea of these courtyards is to create, um, give us another lever to tune the relationship between inside and outside, as well as sub-collectives in the household. Uh, this is something that we saw in, in our research in collective housing, that if there are spaces for smaller groups to gather, it starts creating sub-collectives that actually create more maintenance and stewardship of the commons. Now, I will admit this is not a collective living project. It's a single family home, and this is the struggle of, I think, young offices in America that the commissions you get are often uh, single family homes, but even within the idea of a single family home, is, is there a way that we can treat the design of that to think through um, experiments in collective living and use these as a way to further our own kind of say research into these. So you'll see this kind of range of say introvert, in more introverted spaces on the left uh, to a very private shower space on the far right to the house that actually breaks the enclosure on the in the middle photograph and some of the scale of the smaller courtyard. So there's three courtyards total in the small footprint of the house. Um, and you can see the floor plan here on the left, uh, but you know this, I think when we were designing this, we were thinking maybe more about this floor plan on the right and how this is part of a system that could aggregate up into uh, something more collective. Um, and I think, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Wow, um, it's it's very interesting to to um, have these fascinating moments where you you didn't know each other and you didn't plan this together and you kind of push the powerpoints together, and yet there are some amazing um, intersections between uh, the, your works, even though you're obviously starting from a very both from very different places. Uh, I am curious before I turn it over to. Um, Wow, lots of people here. Um, uh, to, to, to our crowd here. Um, you know, especially in the early project, Niraj, the, the work has a kind of informality and um, the, the, the emphasis on the idea of inclusion, inclusion and um, uh, kind of indeterminate nature uh, produces a, um, it kind of mirrors the informality of the composition of, let's say, in the exhibition that you showed. Um, later, you move in the in your in in the um, present to something that that it, interestingly was rotational mm -hmm. and had that geometric uh, precision. And then I'm also looking in Chris's case, the interest in collective collectivity for the Jain Temple was very clearly um, ge geometric and quite. Um, uh, quite a crystallized idea about geometry. So one of the things that I'm curious about, maybe you, you could tell us what you're, what, what you're thinking about, um, and I'm really curious to hear how you see each other's work in this way. What is the status of composition today, of geometry, of um, some of these things which are handled very differently, I think, in, in, you know, in Niraj, in your case, very differently from the first project to the second project, and in both your projects, the second projects, um, and yet, it seems they're both very interested in in the ways in which they become collective and common. So they're sharing a lot of ideas um, inspirationally. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that. George, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let me try. Um, you know, I. I don't want to comment on where we're at today because <laughs> I think that we're at a lot of different places today, and I think you know a cross section through this building and MIT <laughs> would reveal uh, the range of positions. I can say in our work, um, it's always been important to make legible, make legible the framework um, that then either a natural system 
or a, uh, say a social system where people are acting upon and so that um, the legibility of the kind of start moment of the framework um, is always somehow indexing in some ways the way that it's been reappropriated. Um, so there's kind of a form of measure that's built in to the uh, design itself. Um, and so this idea of the legibility then in some ways forces a restraint in our work in the architecture that um, we're always asking what is the most minimal minimum kind of ge geometric form or way to evoke the range of diversity that we see as catalyzing then something that would be uh, taken over um, by others, uh, by other subjects. Um, and in that way, um, the, the types of geometries range quite a bit from project to project, uh, but they're always maybe joined by the idea of being uh, very simple and legible. Um, and the, I think that kind of, part of the idea of the legibility I think for us um, is both kind of going back to the open work and seeing the hand of the author versus the hand of the, the expanded subject. But I think the other part is that, you know, uh, a belief that for the collective to act as a collective, they need to be able to see themselves as, as part of a collective and that geometry can help clarify where the collective gathers and assembles and, you know, uh, create uh, a moment of stability for that negotiation to happen. Okay. Uh, yeah. Grace, th thanks, thanks for the question. I, I was just thinking as Niraj was uh, explaining, you, your question is so profound that actually I might need six seminar sessions to <laughs> completely unravel that, uh, your question. But, but it's an interesting one. So I, I, I think if I have to say it in, you know, in, within two, three minutes, I would say that for us uh, to link geometry to, let's say, the idea of the collective is precisely where we look at typology or type. In a way in which we, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, no matter where we work, we always feel that we need to look at what is typical rather than what is spectacular or what is uh, an uh, anomaly. Because we felt that by looking at something typical, we are also looking at something that is pervasive, something that is persistent, something that continues to hold relevance in the site, in the city that it resides in. And the way in which we enter the idea of the typical is that we would like to draw upon not the image of the typical, not, let's say, even the experience as such de detached from anything else, but what is the irreducible structure that makes this typical uh, architecture relevant. And why that is important is two parts. One is that we feel that uh, the irreducible structure or the deep structure of type allows one to understand the way spaces are used. Courtyards have a very typical irreducible structure, very different from, let's say, the high rise and so on and so forth. But to really reach deep into that irreducible structure and then to transpose that, abstract that into new solution, right? So in that way, I think we are able to claim that we are reinterpreting, recuperating architecture that is still relevant to where, wherever we looked at. But of course, as authors, we want to reinterpret it. The other is that that clarity of geometry also makes that organizational structure incredibly apparent to use, to see, to experience. But it also allows us to strip down it uh, to strip down the architecture to its bare minimum, to create a lean architecture, almost to say that the structure is the architecture, almost that you almost do not need partition, you do not need anything else, that life could unfold within the structure. So in that way, it becomes collective because it's, it's both familiar and it also, in a way, speaks of some of the fundamental challenges of climate change that we are confronting today. Uh, thanks very much for your presentations. Um, really fascinating and rich. Um, I enjoyed that you both began um, recognizing the importance of context in your work. And I think, Chris, you said, uh, you mentioned it, so being embedded in the context. Um, and Niraj, um, you finished the first session with talking about the structural challenges of working on the ground. Um, and I was wondering whether maybe one or both of you could talk about the challenges of this in your teaching practice um, and how you work with students, and um, particularly the, let's say, the social context um, of uh, working in the uh, projects you work with. 
It's a great question. I think uh, some of my students are here right now, and they can probably attest to it's a really challenging thing. You know, we're studying in this studio um, an area in the Central Valley in California, and we've been doing, on one hand, looking at GIS and kind of data gathered um, in this way that we know is imperfect and kind of a low resolution depiction. Um, and then, you know, students are trying to cross-reference that to like Reddit forums and, you know, Instagram sites and where people are geo-locating themselves. Um, so it's been, I think, uh, you know, for many studios where you're not working in your backyard, a real uh, structural challenge. Usually we try to work with, um, at least in my studios, we try to work with community groups and have a way to land on the ground more quickly with community groups. So uh, like the core MRC studio I teach at CCA. Um, we often work with a group called uh, WOCAN, the West Oakland Cultural Action Network, and um, we can in some ways piggyback off like years of you know embedded research they're doing with the community and have them bring us up to speed. So it's been a vehicle in the short time of a you know 14 week semester. Um, frankly, even on like the communes research we're doing. You know, it's it's very slow because we're going in and measuring people's houses and asking intimate questions about what they fight about <laughs> and whatnot. Like really getting you know personal about like who's leaving the hair and the shower drain and why that's <laughs> caused someone to leave a, leave a house and so forth. Um, but it's it just takes um, it's taken a long time because you have to gain trust of the community and they need to know who your motives are, you know, on their behalf. And um, and I think that's a structural condition that maybe architecture and the way we think about AIA contracts and things like this need to expand to include to think about the length of time that goes in before a project even starts design to get you know, embedded with all, all of those um, pieces of information. No, no, likewise, I think it's, it's a really great, great question. I think there's always a tension between uh, practice and theory, but um, I always feel that you know, we should at best, always try our best to teach what we do and do what we teach. So we always premise uh, the studio as uh, as two things: uh, is that one, it is always affected by challenge of urbanization, and the other one is that each challenge should also inform the way in which we push uh, a certain theoretical and, and, and intellectual framework that is within uh, architecture's discipline. So in a, in a way that. All my studios are always predicated on an urban challenge. So let's say this year we are looking at life sciences cluster in the English countryside. And if you think about it as a challenge, you will see that actually if you read Peter Hall and Manuel Castell in the late 80s, uh, Technopoles of the World, they are a proposition was that most successful uh, tech cluster, research cluster, always are located in the city and always tries to want to be the city precisely because it contains, let's say, the three T's of uh, Florida, right, that he argues in the creative class, technology, uh, talent and tolerance, right? Essentially, it wants research cluster wants to borrow all the kind of resources that comes from a dense urban environment. But increasingly, we are now seeing in England and in the UK that research clusters are now happening in the countryside. So the key question is that how do we begin to, in a way, fundamentally look at spaces of collaboration that is really social in such a space that has very little density? So we title our studio uh, Intensity Without Density. And typologically, we are looking at, of course, uh, what we ask our students, or I ask our students, to look at all the lab building types there is to understand its irreducible structure, but then to look at uh, what we call urban condensers, right? Precedents of urban condensers, uh, archetypes of urban condensers. So we reach out to the history of architecture typologically and draw upon what we call architectures that is able to figure forth the idea of the city, the space of collective in a single building. And through that, the third aspect is to create a lean architecture out of that. So that's why I think that um, the studio always emphasizes that uh, it should, the problems that we confront has to be rooted in the challenges of urbanization today, uh, but it also should uh, allow us to fundamentally challenge and further the discourse of uh, architecture uh, in using its disciplinary knowledge. 
I, I think that's super fascinating also because it seems that though the aims are very similar, Niraj, you're coming at the pedagogy from a ground up um, and you're coming, and Chris, from a kind of top down in terms of the type of building yeah. and that's very fascinating. Yes. Uh, uh, let me turn to other questions. Thank you both for the amazing talk and um, personally also in Niraj's studio, so it's always really inspiring to have your work um, be shared again. And Chris also, um, I took once your seminar and has only seen the kind of theory side of your expertise, but it's been re really refreshing to see your practice and how the same type of thoughts are uh, reiterated. So. Um, yeah, so from both of you guys, it's really it's a really honor to have you guys be at the GSD and challenge the framework of our pedagogy and learning and how we formulate our academic um, studio projects. But also, it seems like you guys are also at the forefront of challenging the framework of practice itself and also of um, adjacent fields such as policymakers and perhaps from the client side on how they m might choose uh, materials and structures in more energy efficient ways and environmentally friendly ways. So I wanted to ask you guys both the question of um, sort of the, the, the state and the position of architectures or architects agency in driving more of a structural and systemic changes in current kind of era. I know that's a big question, a big, big, but if yeah. it, it I, I guess more so from an experiential standpoint, um, what were the challenges and like effective ways that were made? Okay. Yeah, sure, I'll try. Um, well, first, firstly, thank you and Mo for the question. Um, I think um, one thing that's so great about architecture is just it's a way of thinking through a problem <laughs> and trying to think at a range of scales and bring people around a table to move forward on something. And I think those skills that you learn in school um, are really applicable to many other disciplines, uh, whether adjacent to architecture or not adjacent. Like San Francisco, Samsung likes hiring a lot of our students in architecture because they like the way that architecture education trains them to think through feedback loops and think about different scales. So I think there's you know, just a natural thing within our discipline that gives you an openness to think about you know, where your agency resides within the discipline, but also how you communicate with peripheral disciplines. Um, and I think for me, there's always a tension there of you know, say ambitions that do require sometimes planning policy adjustments or uh, working closely with landscape architects or, or thinking through you know, very large scale systems that go beyond any one architecture or any one discipline you know, to solve. Um, but also recognizing the disciplinary agency of the architect as it traditionally stands while trying to expand that dis disciplinary agency. Um, so on one hand, like our disciplinary agency as it currently stands is form and making decisions for clients and providing fee for service, you know, that's sort of the, the bucket that we're within, but can you, be, can you be in the machine and working on the machine at the same time? You know, and, and I think that's a, a challenge in and of itself, but I think that's where at least I've tried to position my practice is trying to, you know, work with allied and adjacent disciplines and think through how architectural research is a very specific form of research that can play a role in planning policy in a way that planning research might not uh, have the same agency in. But at the same time, can we think through dimensionality and materiality that sets up frameworks that will persist uh, for many years and also can be reappropriated in ways that we might not be able um, to anticipate? So I think that... Um, this idea of like riding a car while you're like working on the engine to make the car some, do something else <laughs> is something I'm always grappling with. Of you know, are we are we just accepting the car as is, <laughs> and um, you know, is it driving us now and we're not driving it, or are we still working on the car um, simultaneously, or do we need to just get out of the car and get a new vehicle <laughs> and you know, uh, go a different way altogether? And so I'm always kind of working through <laughs> where we're at and um, what makes most sense at the current moment. Yeah. No, I, I agree with what Niraj is saying. I, uh, 
Definitely. I think uh, it depends on what scale you're working uh, in. So I've shown you three projects, oh, maybe four. They were all architectural scale. Maybe the last one is slightly larger. We also work uh, in urban design and master planning. And at different, in different disciplines and approaches, I think you just need to be aware where, in a way, where you can make the most impact. So just in terms of what I showed you, because I didn't show our urban design and master planning work, but let's say on the scale of architecture, I think I've already touched upon, you know, uh, the persistent architecture, the typical. I've also talked about lean architecture. Maybe another way to think about the way in which we contribute, uh, and I think this comes to the idea of cityness. And when I say that a building has that dimension of cityness, it means that it has a certain um, idea of the collective. And when it has an idea of collective in a single building, I think what we as architects could do is to use the minimal of means to create architecture that is generous beyond the client's brief. So let's say if you look at the court, the court tower, um, it is unusual, or you will never find, 13 uh, sky gardens that was placed onto a courthouse. And it's something that we bring to, let's say, the decision maker and client to say that such an important building should, that is used to be closed should be open, should be generous. Likewise, I think with um, the ashram is, is a building that is made with really, really modest means. And again, is to find how to create an architecture that can be so generous in terms of the use of space, in terms of its experience uh, that goes beyond the client's brief. And I think that you'll see as well in the last one that I showed you, the last thing a client would want is to make a lobby triple the size that that they can pay for. But we managed to do that by actually tweaking the rule uh, in Singapore, uh, which is called pop space, uh, uh, pub, privately owned public space that is exempt from the maximum uh, gross floor area that is allowable on site. So that is to say that if you create a pop space uh, that does not impede upon the maximum area a developer will build. So what we did was to say to our client, Think about your lobby now as in five times the size that you would normally do, but you make it into a pop space and it's created by this beautiful timber structure that is lean. So I think it's those moments that you challenge the typology, but also be so well, at, as well informed about the planning policy behind it to create this generous architecture. Yeah. Great. Another question. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation today. So for me, what was really astonishing to discover is that both of your work manifest kind of like that fluidity between personal and collective space, but also like how that becomes a sense of dialogue. But for example, like the, the use of shelf, which is personal, but it becomes an urban shelf for the collective, or the notion of like having a collective space in a single family house. But what I feel these days, which is kind of like, which with the immediate climate issues or um, cultural violences or also the emergence of digital age, what I sense, and also the AI starting to take over our jobs, um, I feel that these forces are obstructing the dialogue between personal and collective. And as architects, I'm curious to hear, how do we preserve that value of having a dialogue? So l let me understand your question. Is uh, you th uh, do you think AI is impeding this this dialogue between the two? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I I have. Mo uh, I think it's a great question. It's really hard to answer. So because it's such an evolving, you know. Uh, uh, sorry, Niraj, I just jumped. Please, please <laughs> jump into it. <laughs> That's all so, you. <laughs> um, so I would just say that I will give a tentative uh, uh, response to this. Um, I don't think it impedes because, uh, and I don't think AI is such a threat because if you actually look at the, uh, the history of architecture, AI is essentially looking at data sets, looking at shared characteristic, looking at si elements that are similar. In the discipline of architecture, that's typological, right? We, following Argan, he says, a type is said to arise when we can detect a series of buildings and objects that shares the same characteristic. 
That's AI to me, right? So in the sense, typological intelligence allows the discipline to very quickly move into the domain of AI if we are aware of the history of architectural knowledge. Essentially, typological thinking essentially arise out of enlightenment, right? Essentially, it's the first time in which rational rationality, together with the, with, with the uh, enlightened society, makes architecture a knowledge that wants to be scientific. And in that sense, that mode of analysis, of comparing similarities, and then to create something else, is firmly in architecture discipline. So I, I, I don't see that as impeding. I think it's something that, as architects, we can quickly move into this. Yeah, um, maybe I'll touch more on the technology, the larger technology question that um, was the first part of the question. Um, you know, I, I, I always go back to Hannah Rant's text, The Human Condition, where she really talks about the public sphere being a space of appearance and the, the way things appear is because someone's willing to share something and put it out there. And the act of putting something out in the public realm for her affirms a sense of reality. That, you know, when you put something out that's vulnerable, I think she says, like, exist in the shadowy existence of your thoughts, but when you make it fit for appearance and say it out loud, and someone else hears it, you can't take it back. It's out there in the public realm. And reality is formed through that. And I think that's a very different type of reality than is formed, say, than through social media apps, which might be affirming maybe uh, non-reality more than reality. And so I think there's always going to be, like for me, the kind of as technology becomes uh, more pervasive, it actually puts more of a role on physical space to do the things that technology uh, can't do currently, and um, so I'm not. I'm not worried about it. I think they they will complement each other, and um, you know, I, I don't think it's done too much for us so far in, in the last 20 years in architecture. So, I think we have time for one more question. All right, uh, thank you. Um, I'm thinking about the critique of authorship in both of your uh, work and wondering if there's also a critique of a conventional project timeline. So uh, you could say, according to contracts, you have substantial completion, the architect's work is done, you take your pro professional photos and call it a day. But um, it seems to me you're both interested in a more expanded view of the life of a project. I'm wondering when, for you, is a project complete? If you are interested in what happens after the building is finished, the life it takes, how it uh, folds back into the city, then what does it mean for your working methods as an architect today? <laughs> no, Andrew's a great question. So, yeah, well, I, I think uh, the way we approach this with regards to, let's say, post occupancy is that it is, we think about this in a way that is already within the first step of the design when we start designing it. That's why we call. Uh, at least in, in, my last, uh, in my last part, I call it lean frameworks. To use the word framework is already to use, uh, is to assume that there is a certain uh, accommodative quality to the structure. That is to say that there is no finality in it and that it is flexible enough to accommodate change, to accommodate future expansion or future demolition, or, or sorry, uh, future programmatic uh, redundancy, not, uh, not demolition. And in that sense, I think it also very much um, mirrors uh, my first reading of Rossi, right? That the urban artifact is is permanent and propelling precisely because it is independent of programmatic redundancy or programmatic expiry. So we always try to design as such that the structure is not, or the irreducible structure is not a direct uh, um, answer to a specific client brief, but it looks at architecture that will persist or has persisted and therefore we think will persist. So it's an open framework, right? Very, very specific with regards to its organization, but incredibly open-ended with regards to its programmatic possibilities. So in that sense, I think our involvement, in a way direct involvement ends once it's completed, but our intellectual uh, and conceptual involvement and ambition persists precisely because we have embedded it from the very beginning as a, as a framework, as an open framework. Yeah. And, and with regards to authorship, I think as, as a practice, we, 
we, in a way, are very allergic to the master sketch because uh, we work very collaboratively in the office, it's very flat, uh, and also, in a way, we don't want to betray uh, the genesis of the practice, right? Essentially, we claim that we want to look at architectures that are typical. And by that stance, we are also saying that our project is, in a way, a continuing voice in that long discourse and long dialogue. So I think that genius sketch, we are, we are more chilled about it, yeah. Um, well, first of all, shout out to Andrew, who was uh, worked on the Venice Biennial project in her office and built um, some of the beautiful models that were in that slide. Um, I think, you know, part of what I'm interested in urbanism is feedback between an idea and it being in the world and some, some of the kind of things that never got built in urbanism we keep cycling back to because we never got feedback of them built in the world. So there's still sort of like that itch, like the, like the competition, you know, yeah. the, that itch that hasn't been scratched. So I'm very interested in that. And in our work, because the framework is to be reappropriated, you know, how it's reappropriated is in the end the project. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a really smart question. I was um, taken by a visit to Seoul recently where I got to visit some of Yamamoto's housing projects. And in one of them, the service manager gave us a tour of the complex who was basically responsible to, for all the maintenance and you know, coordinating the trades and so forth. And he was also a side, uh, like a photographer on the side. <laughs> and so he walked around with his like, large camera while we were there. And, um, and he's just been documenting the life in this project. And he was telling us that Yamamoto comes and visits once a year and meets with him and looks at the photo and learns how people are using these projects. And I thought, what, what a just incredible uh, resource that is to have on site someone that's so involved in sort of the front end and back end of a project and is documenting this uh, thoroughly uh, for a, any designer to learn from and see how these spaces that you give over are then used to you know change assumptions right because in the end it comes down to assumptions and how uh, those assumptions sometimes go untested and we just keep doing them um, and you know that feedback mechanism of us adjusting our assumptions I think is super key. Thank you so much. Thanks. This is a great session. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.